The Woodwright Shop is made possible in part by grants from State Farm Insurance Companies. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. By the Cooper Group, manufacturers of hand tools. And by this and other public television stations. Again, welcome back to the Woodwright Shop. My name is Roy Underhill. This is the very first program of a whole new season of the Woodwright Shop, and I'm going to take a second to show you some of the things we're going to be making. We're going to start out making a spring pole lathe like this. Well, it's not really a spring pole lathe. It actually runs off a bow that twists this cylinder, and you can keep it right in the house without any problem. We're going to use it to make all kinds of things. We're going to start out making some stuff for the kitchen that'll sure to get you in good with the cook, things like spoons and rolling pins and collapsing goblets and pie crimpers. We're also gonna use the lathe to make this fine little pilgrim chair out of one piece of oak firewood. We're gonna take care of your tool problem. We're gonna make you a nice tool chest out of poplar with lots of dovetails. And later on, we're gonna learn how to make a whole new kind of seat, a rush seat here, like this one, that actually uses cattails to make the bottom of the chair. And to get the cattails, well, we're going to make us a little cypress rowboat and take it out to sea. We're going to learn how to put up a whole new blacksmith shop up at Williamsburg. We'll learn all kinds of carving. So lots to do, but where do you begin? Well, if you've been interested in traditional woodworking, there is one place from which much of our knowledge springs. It's really the Rosetta Stone of woodworking, and that's the place we're going to go right now. Well, here's the place, and here's the man I want you to meet. Charles, good to see you again. Hi, Roy. How are you? Just fine, thank you. This is Charles Hummel. He is the Deputy Director of Collections here at the Wintertree Museum just outside of Wilmington, Delaware. And he is a man I greatly envy because he is the keeper of the Domini Shop. That's correct. And he has promised to show us around. Uh, where, where shall we begin? Why don't we start at the back of the shop? Great, great. This is like uh, getting into the treasure house for a little while because, well, that's what this place is. It is a national treasure. And you must feel like the king in a woodworker's kingdom here. Absolutely. It is great. This is, what you see, all these tools, all the benches, all the planes, the lathes, the equipment, all from one family. That's right. Uh, three generations of craftsmen who worked in East Hampton, New York from about 1750 to about 1850. We have all of the original benches, the original lathes. We have uh, about 1,100 tools that were used in, in this shop. Mm. And this is the Domini shop, and it's been preserved here at the Winterthur Museum. And, and this is what you care for and study and reassemble. This is your place. Yes, that's uh, mm. correct. We reassembled this starting in 1957 and opened it to the public in 1960. Mm. Well, the wonderful thing is there are so many. It's wonderful that it's preserved, but there are so many answers that you're going to find here for questions that woodworkers have. Just, just wonderful, clever things that people do. Well, let's start looking at their lathe, the spring pole lathe for turning. Uh, what, what is this piece here? Well, uh, this is obviously a finished piece that someone has done. So I'm not going to cut on it. Then. <laughs> Good, uh, but it represents the kind of sophisticated stretcher, front chair stretcher that might be seen on Long Island or Connecticut armchairs. Mm -hmm. And a reciprocating lathe, just one person to run this one. That's right. Has a great advantage. Mm. Uh, what's amazing to me is the depth of your of what was preserved here, because well, not only is this spring pole lathe here, but actually the last spring pole that the Dominies used is here still. Uh, I don't want to pull pole. too far on it, but it's still here. That's you, right. You, and we replaced it with a hickory sapling. Mm. Mm -hmm. so, we, so we can work with this today. Uh, you even have uh, some of the attachments for the 
lathe. Uh, you can, well, it's, it's no longer lathe when you put this in. This makes it a saw. Of course, it goes in uh, flat to you, but this mounts down in the lathe, and, and it's a what now? Uh, up and down saw, or as it was called in the 18th century, a gate saw. So this would mount there in the treadle to pull this blade up and down and uh, the spring pole return it. And this is for cutting out the pieces for furniture and, and the various things they did. Yes, uh, they might cut out uh, the bottom boards, for example, for drawers, or mm. the side boards for drawers, or even perhaps cut planking for uh, bedsteads that were going to be turned. Now, something like this could be made very, very rough, but this is beautiful work, isn't you, it? You'll note that it's made out of a handsome piece of cherry, mm. and the joinery is really very, very fine. Oh, it's a splendid piece. Now, one thing I should tell you, although you can visit the Winterthur Museum and see all around, uh, see in, into the shop, you won't be able to handle everything like we're doing here. So this is a rare privilege for us here. We're delighted to have you here in the shop today because obviously in showing you the shop, we also show it to the general public at large. That's great. Well, the. Uh, uh, depth of your collection, uh, but not the tools you have, the uh, the records that they have. You even have some of the patterns, don't you? That was left by them. We have products and we have patterns, and because we had some of the patterns survive, they're really very rare to have templates. All cabinet makers use them in the 18th century and early 19th century, but they almost never survive. But there was a nice group of them that survived in the Domini shop, and maybe you'd like to look at a few I of them. Would. We have some over here on this bench. Mm. But y'all realize this is really miraculous for. Three generations of craftsmen, all their tools, their patterns, their records, everything. You, well, you've even got the, the patterns hanging from the ceiling up here. Yes, we have some overhead. You just pulled down a large pattern for a slat. A, a slat, they made chairs, of course. That's right. And uh, here's a slat pattern for one of the smaller slats. Uh -huh. They'd be graduated uh, so that you could have a large one at the top and gradually getting bigger toward the bottom of the chair. Now, this must be an, an arm, is that correct? Yeah, that's a pattern for uh, an armrest, um, for a rocking armchair, or just a, a straight armchair. And what would, what would this be? And that's, of course, a splat for uh, a side chair, or perhaps an armchair, a vase-shaped, Queen Anne-style mm, splat. Mm, mm. So these are, these are the patterns, the templates that they would use to lay out. Well, here, here we've got one. This is a cabriole leg template. And it's got the, here's the leg that they made. Here's one of the uh, unfinished legs uh, in process. It had already been shaped using this pattern or template. And uh, of course, these made the uh, tripod bases for candle stands or tea tables. Oh, that's splendid. Well, this is like, uh, this must have been like King Tut Tuck and Tom Tuck and Common's tomb getting in there. What an incredible find. It was, because uh, with the completeness of the collection, we have a, a fine record of, of the state of Western technology in the uh, 18th century and early 19th century. And we also have a very complete idea of what most active craftsmen's shops were like who uh, practiced woodworking. Well, and you learn, we can learn a lot of very practical things. If you're a chair maker, look at this. This is a splat bending jig. Is that right? That's correct. You steam it and just slip it in there and peg yep. it up here at the top. And yep. After the wood has been made flex uh, flexible by either steaming or uh, heating, mm -hmm. dipping in water, you put that into the jig and bend it. And when it dried out, it would retain its curve. That's great. So it's not only how they did it, it's how you can do it too. And well, you have some of the products from this, don't you? We can show you not only uh, how these slats were bent in a jig like this, but we can actually show you a curved slat in, is, in a chair. Of this, this is kind. one right here. Yes, this chair was made in the Domini shop. Oh, boy. And as you can see, the back of it is curved. Uh, and then the shaping would be done with a bow saw and some other uh -huh. tools as well. I see. And here's some, some more tools down here. This, this, this is a tenon cutter here. A tenon cutter that All right. fits into a bit that fits right into that brace. Goes into the brace. Now, you see this? This has two little cutters right there, and this will cut the tenon on the end of a, of a round. That's correct. So if you can't find a tenon cutter, well, you can jolly well go out and make yourself one just like the Dominies did, uh, just a block of wood. In fact, they made the brace here as well. Yes, they did. Uh -huh. and, and it's very handy because you can just pop that out and put in another put in a perfect versatile bit. Fit. Oh, now, this is great. This, is, uh, this cuts the reciprocal to that uh, joint, I take it. This uh, goes in there, but it's a stop. If you've had trouble with uh, boring holes for the rounds to go in the uprights of a chair, well, just make yourself a spoon bit like this on a stick that has a stop, and it'll keep it from breaking through on the other side. side. Oh, that's great. And again, if you pop that out, I can show you what another uh, what? of their bits will this do. This long one here? This long Let's one? Let's see what that does. Is that, wait, I can guess. Is that for this side right here? Yeah. 
If uh -huh. you're making a chair of this type and you want to have a support to, uh, to run from the stretcher uh -huh. to the armrest or arm support, obviously you want that to be aligned because it runs through the chair frame and also runs into the stretcher. Mm -hmm. Well, with chair makers who had a long spoon bit of this type, they could not only get that uh, lined up correctly through measurement, but they could actually drill right through uh, the chair frame and drill into the stretcher and make certain that they had a perfect alignment and a perfect fit. So this is very clever stuff, and it worked 200 years ago, and it'll work today. Just Well, I, here's something. Can we try out this uh, a stock knife? Is that what it's... A stock or a black knife. Uh, this you right notice here. that many of the parts of the chair are turned. Uh -huh. And uh, Turner wanted to save some time and prepare a stock in advance, and so he used a stock or a black knife oh, to great. chamfer the edges and, <laughs> and clean up uh, the stock so he didn't have to spend as much time with a chisel or, uh, or a gouge on the Ugh. lathe. Charles, this is the best working stock knife I have ever used. By well, far. one of the beautiful. secrets, I think, is the fact that although stock or block knives were in use from the 17th through the early 19th century, most of them have a straight handle coming back on uh -huh. the shaft. But the Dominies added a nice twist. They had a stirrup-shaped oh, handle, yeah. uh, sort of like the stirrup on a saddle on a horse. And uh, that you can you... hold that with one hand and get wonderful control of the direction. Great. Boy, it's got wonderful control. So you can, a lot of these tools that uh, you just, well, you never think of anymore, they still work. They're great. And you can, well, you can still use them today. Well, Nothing like that. Roy, we'd like to say that we know how every tool in the shop was used, but actually there were a group of mystery tools in the shop. Some of them still haven't been identified because they were used for a special purpose. For a long time, this axe, for example, uh, was unidentified and really puzzled a number of, of ah. woodworkers. Oh, uh, they knew it was early, beautifully hand wrought. Uh, we can tell that it dates about 1725 to 1730 by this shield-shaped mark with a crown uh, over it. And uh, there are lots of guesses about how it might have been used and, and who might have used it. But we finally were able to identify it recently through some um, pictures in early 19th century woodworking so really? sources huh. that show a carpenter using this to uh, trim the edges of floorboards or uh -huh. to uh, trim or level off the joists underneath floorboards. And so with a tool like this, you could make certain not only that your floorboards were aligned side by side, but also that your floor was level. That's great. That's great. Well, if you're a carpenter laying floors, this is what you need. But this, this is really just extinct now. You just yes, well, Many not, of these tools still exist in some form or another. But not this, in common use at all, of course. Well, you have got more tools here than you could shake a stick. Well, we have some more on this bench that you I have, think would delight you. You have two of my favorites that I know uh, I knew long ago from seeing them in your book with hammer in hand way before I saw them here in the wood. This, this is the uh, skew rabbit plane? A skew rabbit plane made out of cherry. Mm, mm, mm. Boy, it, it's something about this. I don't know what it is, but this really charms me. It, it's, it's brittle. Cherry is very brittle. And this one has uh, cracked here at the handle and at the mouth. Yes, it's and been repaired. Beautiful piece of work here. Uh -huh. Another nice feature of this plane is that the owner's initials are on the front, uh -huh. so we know that Nathaniel Dominey made it. And it's stamped with the uh, date, the year in which he made uh, the plane. Uh oh as are many of these tools in the collection. When uh, they are dated, uh, we know exactly when they went into use then in the shop, oh, and so they're great. a wonderful group of documents. For historians of technology, there's just nothing like having exactly. someone put a date on it when they first make it. So that's right. They made their own planes, the Dominies did, and made their bow saws. This bow saw is just a charmer, and it's also cherry, is that right? Also made out of cherry. The grain just flows around the corner, just perfect. Turns this corner, and then this brace coming down, perfect chamfering and joinery. It's just a beautiful piece of work here. And you notice that they apparently got tired of using a winding stick uh -huh. because they used a bolt and a nut uh, a, to use a, for adjustment. That's an interesting twist. Tightening the well. <laughs> Yes, all right. This, uh, the Dominies were out on uh, Tip of Long Island, right? Tip of right Long on. Island, 120 miles from New York City, and so quite isolated, except uh, for uh, transportation by sea. They were surrounded by water, and that might account for the fact that uh, some of their tools are made out of this wonderful material. Oh, oh, this is what, whalebone? This is whalebone. East oh. Hampton was near Sag Harbor, Whoa. and uh, Sag Harbor was the center of a whaling industry in the 18th and early 19th century, and of course there were oh. whales uh, offshore Long Island. A marking gauge out of whalebone, and here's a tri-square 
out of whalebone. Boy, it's, it's, it, is whalebone stable? Because you know how you have wood with it. It has much well, more stability uh, than wood, and so it's a very nice material uh, from which to fashion tools. Boy, that's beautiful. So how'd you like to have a spoke shave out of whalebone? <laughs> not, not something you can do these days. But then it was, the whales must have been quite common. Very, off, very off important the... uh, to the uh, community. In fact, so important that uh, every shop, like the Dominies, and every home had a whaling horn. A, wh a whaling horn? Yeah, when someone uh, sighted a whale, they would uh, grab their whaling horn in the shop or at home and uh, sound it so that the neighbors would know and sound their horns and everyone would come running and go into lifeboats uh, to uh, go, uh, I'm sorry, I said lifeboats, I meant whaling boats, in order to go and hunt whales offshore. Is that one right there? Some of the horns have survived in yes. the shop. We've got a couple here. That's, uh, did they make these or were these come from the tinsmith No, tin these would have been town. made by a uh, local, local tinsmith in town, but they, they still work. This doesn't work here. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Mighty Blast. I think the idea that's was to great. scare the whales half to death. <laughs> Splendid. Well, you not only got the, they've not only got the tools here, you have the benches and everything. And this bench, I don't know anyone that wouldn't love to have a bench like this. It's a massive piece of uh, red oak. Red oak, tw mm. uh, 12 feet long. Mm. Six inches thick and 20 inches wide. Boy, that is really sturdy. And it's, it's rather low. Is it about 29 inches? That's right. But remember, um, today we're used to power tools and want our benches to be up a little higher. Not me. But uh, to get <laughs> the shoulder and arm muscle into uh, your work, this height is wonderful. Mm. Well, it's a massive piece of wood, but the, the, well, the refinements, this I take it is a sliding... Uh, uh, tool rest here. This this slides along, and uh, the pegs interchangeable for different Pikes depth of boards. boards. So for planing on the edge of a board, if it was long, you'd slide it back, and if it was narrow, you'd peg it up higher, and that would relate it to this uh, bench screw up here. So exactly. that bench screw vice up here, and you put your boards in, and there you are. Yeah, that's great. This is the oldest uh, of the benches, is it not? This is the oldest of the benches in the shop. Mm. Mm -hmm. this, oh, well, you have a, a newer one that really solves some problems for me. I know. Many people wondered you know, uh, whether in the middle of the 18th century it was possible to uh, fashion a big, heavy screw, such uh -huh. as this kind, for a screw vise. Well, uh, it was, and we can provide the answer by taking a look at a bench that was made probably f by Felix Domini about 1820 or Which, 1830. Well, that's, that's the, the one, that's one in the shop. And if we come over here to take a look at it, uh, we can see how they were able to make these large screws and also to thread them. Well, I knew how you made the screws. You use a, a little screw uh, box like this one right here. This uh, screw box, uh, th well, this is for making small clamps right That's here. That's correct. This is like a die for making uh, wooden threads here. And you can see, I guess we can take this apart. Can I not? Yes, sure. Really. Open it up here. Yeah, that because cutter should pop right out. Let's see. Well, there's the cutter. You uh, approach the wood from the back side, and as you crank this around, that cutter cuts a spiral thread in the wood. Now, of course, you'd have a much bigger one for a piece like this. For yes. the bench vices, mm -hmm. yes. Well, what I could figure, and I had that figured out in my own little way how to cut the uh, uh, external thread on there, but there was a real mystery I was dealing with. I had a bench like this. How do you cut the thread, the inside thread, into a big, huge piece of oak like this? Well, I'll show you how you, you normally do it. You use a tap like this, this uh, tap has a, it's just a piece of hickory and it has a cutting tooth right there. And this big coarse thread right here, you put a metal plate on there. Is that, exactly. is that right? Put a, a metal plate, plate on there and just crank it through. And as this uh, plate draws that cutter forward through the wood in an advancing spiral, it cuts an internal thread. And you just do it several passes and knock the th uh, cutter a little deeper each time. But the thing is, you have to have a guide plate on the back here. And I couldn't figure out, well, how do you get the guide plate inside this big block of wood? Well, what you do, of course, I found out when I looked underneath here last time I was here was you cut a big slot here and then cut a small slot and that's where that uh, kind of uh, circular piece of metal that fits into those coarse wooden grooves goes in there and then only this part is threaded and so it's pulled through there and cuts that thread. And that really solved a problem that I was dealing with. And there's another trick on this little bench. This, uh, if you look right under here, there is a slowly sliding out 
little grease cup here. And this is, what would they use this for? Well, the grease cup could be used to uh, lubricate soles and planes. It might be used to lubricate uh, your uh, lathe, the arbors, or uh, puppets on uh, a lathe. And saws and plane saws. bottoms and auger bits. So all, just, it's great. What a wonderful setup. Now, you have something else I know that's real clever. Well, there are some marvelous tools in this collection that shed light on uh, how certain types of objects were made by cabinet makers, for example. We mentioned that uh, the Dominis made a number of candle stands and mm -hmm. tea tables, and of course they had to cut large cir circles for the tops of uh, those pieces. They were also clock makers, and so they had to uh, make the pattern or shape for a clock dial and also mm. for uh, the hoods of their clocks. And they use this machine. This is, you know, how you can trace an o uh, a circle with just a compass, but to do an oval, you need a thing like this. And this is called a what? An oval in, uh, tracing machine? In encyclopedias of the 18th century, that's called an oval tracing machine. Mm. And it's a mechanical engine to generate a real world counterpart part of a mathematical abstraction, I guess, but it works. <laughs> yes, it works very well. It's beautiful. In fact, it, it uh, it can be programmed to uh, make any size circle or ellipse that you'd like by adjusting these wedges and moving I'll these be. blocks along the shaft. Uh, you can get the desired size That's circle great. or ellipse. You can make a hard disk, I guess. Uh, the, the, the table top. <laughs> and I see one right behind me. Is this one that? Uh, the, this is a Domini piece right here. This is, is a Domini piece. It was made in the shop mm. and made for Nathaniel Domini V in 1796. Oh, so he made it for himself. He made it for himself, and that may account for the fact that it's made out of mahogany rather than cherry, which was uh, most popular cabinet-making wood for most of his customers, cherry well, and But maple. he liked mahogany. He liked mahogany. He's a mahogany man. Well, it's, it's, you can see the... Uh, cabriole leg down here the that is that's from one of the patterns or a similar mm, pattern one of the patterns that have survived was used to uh, fashion these legs mm. and the column turned on the uh, lathes here let's see if i can there's a catch under here is there not yes there uh, is i got the catch it's there we are tilt top tea table whoa excellent excellent look at that mm, mm, mm. Now this, how, how long would it take to make something like this well, here in this shop? Well, because the records are so complete, we have their account books for many, many years. Uh, we know that in the 18th century, they charged, a cabinet maker charged one-third for materials, one-third for labor, and a third for profit. And uh, taking those figures in the account books, we know that he spent about nine hours to make this table complete with the finish. That's nine hours nine of the hours. usual 11 or 12 hour day. All right, well, if you've got nine hours, why don't you all <laughs> not get one of these for yourselves? Nine hours, that's what, now, this, this top, this is a, this is turned, is it not? This is turned, as you can see, it's made of two pieces because in many right here, country yeah. cabinet making shops, they didn't always have the size stock they desired. And so he had a large piece and a smaller piece glued together to make up one. But in order to turn it, he had to use another very special piece of equipment that, again, survives only in the Domini tool collection and can't even be seen in contemporary uh, encyclopedias. If you'd like to look at it, we can take a look at it here. Yes, I'd like to. The, uh, great wheel lathe. <laughs> if it's, uh, it's not even an encyclopedias, I mean, there no. is no other. It, this is it. This a is lathe it. arbor and cross. And this provides uh, the evidence that we'd known about and heard about for years that these tabletops were turned in a vertical uh, position. In other words, here, here's a, a, a used tabletop, uh, one that uh -huh. was left over in the shop. And that would mount on the, on this the cross. This mount on the cross, uh -huh. like so. With screws and, and then this, this. fits into the lathe bed and is wedged in place. And then the cross juts out over the edge of the uh, lathe bed and the uh, pulley uh, is attached to the right great there. wheel with a rope. That no. is splendid. Well, that's how you can turn your uh, tabletops, an arbor and cross. An arbor and cross. Mm -hmm. Now, can we try it? This is the great wheel lathe right here I see before me. Can we try it out? Of is course we can. It? I'll Certainly. put a piece in. If you put a piece of stock in, in the bed, All right. I'll uh, adjust the rope. All right. Does that mean you're going to turn the uh, wheel for I'll me be as the, well? I'll be the apprentice. <laughs> I'll well, function as the apprentice it and an uh, do the turning. That is great. Let's take a look wheel. at the... Uh, uh, may I use this skew chisel as well? Yes, indeed. This is... Look at this. This is, this is an old sword blade, I believe. Uh, is that right? Yes, it's inlaid and dated 1660. Unbelievable. So an old sword blade. Let's try it out now. I'm ready. Right now, ready I'll have to art. crank this out up. All right. Oh. Oh! 
No, hold it. Hold it. Oh my, this is, uh, these are uh, uh, a little Everything's accident going on the wood. Now yeah. you see, that was the value of having an apprentice turn the wheel because he could watch the master yeah. at work and when the master made mistakes, and they did make mistakes in the 18th century. Well, I think I just the, made one of the The 20th. apprentice would learn from it. Well, this, this is not the only uh, lathe here in the shop. Uh, you have uh, others as well, or actually in the other shop. We have uh, a number of metalworking lathes because they were clock makers and uh, also repaired all kinds of uh, metalwork. And so they have metalworking lathes in the clock shop. Would I'd love like to, to see them. Yes, please. Them? Okay, fine. Why don't you follow me? All right. Will do. Well, here we are, Roy, in the Domini clock shop. And here's an example oh. of a Domini tall case clock. The case, of course, would have been made in the woodworking shop, but the gears and the framework for the clockworks were made right in this shop. Would they have called this a grandfather clock during that time? No, actually, the Domini's name for this clock, one of their most expensive, was a repeating alarm monition horologiographical clock. <laughs> and most of the time, people simply referred to them as a tall case clock. After the gears had been cast and they were ready to cut them to size or to polish them, they'd use a lathe, but a smaller version of the lathes that were in the woodworking shop. This is an oh. example of a clockmaker's oh. lathe. But this is great, and powered by a little tread, treadle wheel Treadle down underneath here. the bench. He could sit at the bench, keeping his hands free. And that's a little polishing wheel mounted in here right now. Polishing wheel attachment. Out. You could take yeah. it out, and there were any number of attachments for it. What a great little lathe. That's so small. That's neat. Well, if you think that one is small, take a look at this English. Oh, my uh, goodness. Watchmaker's Whoa. lathe. Look at that. Now, this would be driven by a little bow, is that right? Powered by a bow and powered by hand, yes. Oh, that is something. Well, how about the gear teeth? How would you cut the teeth in the gears? Well, the gear teeth for clock wheels were cut on a, a clockmaker's engine, and that's a marvelous machine. We have one oh, in the Domini shop. Boy, there it is. It is marvelous. So that's the little gear cutter. You take the, the gear cutter, blank wheel and, and just mount it in there? Mount it on the center, and that's attached to an index plate. I Underneath see. is the index plate in which scientifically and mathematically they figured out I the see. size of the gear wheel and the number of teeth to be cut. And that would advance it just one turn of the gear and you cut the next it. tooth. Exactly. And, and you different. could regulate the depth of the cut by moving the gear cutter or cutter mm. cutting wheel in and out. That is wonderful. A remarkable machine. Charles, thank you. It's a remarkable place here at the Winterthur Museum, the Domini Shops, and I thank you for letting You're us You're very welcome, you. Roy. It's been a pleasure. Come back and visit us soon. Thank you very much. And Listen, thank you all for joining me here in the Woodwright Shop. This is Roy Underhill. So long. The Woodwright Shop is made possible in part by grants from State Farm Insurance Companies. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. By the Cooper Group, manufacturers of hand tools. And by this and other public television stations. Roy Underhill is the author of The Woodwright Shop and The Woodwright's Companion, published by the University of North Carolina Press and available in bookstores and libraries nationwide.